Olympic catch up for the old people. It is an amazing fact that the elderly just don't realise how little time they may have left. <laughs> this could be your last holiday, so make the most of it. Let's go. <laughs> Cram it all in before you die. <laughs> right, push in. Close. I don't want to go through this conversation at every block. You move quick, you get close. Closer. Right. As we came through, someone asked me if I'd shaved this morning. The answer is yes. Although it appears that I haven't, I am between beards. Right? Between beards. I had a beard, I shaved it off, I'm growing another. <laughs> Surely you should know about these things. And the relevance Yeah. No, no, no. I've just been, I've just been accused of being scruffy and I'm not. That's it. Yeah. So there we are. I also asked if I'm a soldier. No, I'm not. I used to be. In order to be a yeoman warder, you must have a minimum of 22 years military service. And overwhelmingly, we are drawn from the army. We do have four from the Royal Air Force. No one talks to them. <laughs> we also have two Royal Marines, and these are instantly identifiable because they're usually holding hands. <laughs> you have to reach the rank of Sergeant Major. That might make me seem a little scared. Right. If you have all of that, you can apply to join the Yeoman of the Guard, Queen's personal bodyguard for ceremonial and state occasions. And if you've also got the Meritorious Service Medal, you get invited. I was invited. Yeah. Now, on those occasions, we do wear a very different uniform. I know you're disappointed not to see me in it today. That is the Tudor bonnet, white ruff, scarlet and gold tunic with red breeches and tights. <laughs> we only ever wear that in the presence of Her Majesty because she likes it. <laughs> 35 Yeoman warders are selected from the Yeoman body to come and live and work here in the town. This is our casual day-to-day -day wear. It is known as blue undress and is modelled on a Tudor tunic. It's made to be worn under a suit of armour. It's not a frock. These things are for the leg plates, all right? You want men in skirts? Scotland. <laughs> Although, you can get that kind of action in Soho. <laughs> and I'm sure the Royal Marines will be happy to tell you where. <laughs> yeah. Right. Now that I've got your questions out of the way, we can carry on talking about what we're supposed to. You're now standing in a killing ground. Yeah, sadly no longer operational. <laughs> As an attacking army, you'd have lost dozens, possibly hundreds of men, trying to get through that festering bog of a moat wrestling with the polar bears and trying to climb the walls. And all the time you're doing that, there are people trying to kill you. It is unlikely that you would have got this far, but if you did, unlucky! You might not have noticed this yet, but behind you there is another wall. The inner defensive wall dates from the 1220s, has 13 defensive towers and a 50-foot curtain. There was only one way through, that archway. And as you can see, it is defended by a two and a half ton oak and steel portcullis. And beyond it, those gates weigh a further three tons. Five and a half tons of oak and steel that you're going to have to hack through with your poxy little swords and axes. And that will take time. Time is a luxury you rarely have in battle. And the defenders will now be hurling vicious verbal abuse at you. Not to mention stones, arrows, buckets of boiling tar, cows, sheep, salad, unwanted children. Everything would have been thrown at you. It's not a healthy place to stand. In fact, you couldn't stand here. Up until the year 1275, this was the River Thames. You'd be drowning now. The lower left of the archway, you'll see there's a mooring loop for a boat that hasn't been used in 700 years, but bizarrely gets painted every ten. When the outer wall was built, it was a tremendous feat of military engineering. <laughs> military engineering. Yeah. The river had to be pushed back. This roadway was raised about six and a half metres, 20 feet to the height you're on today. This became the river entrance. Now this is the world infamous Traitor's Gate, which is not its original name. Originally, and obviously, it was known as the Watergate um, for the simple reason that boats and barges would come in here and deliver stores and provisions. Because of that, it quickly became known as the Trader's Gate, like the tradesman's entrance, yeah? 
But in the 16th century, there was something of a human traffic, and that was largely one way. A lot of these people were prisoners, many accused of treason, and the watermen slid the name to Traitor's Gate. I will point out that the tower was not built as a prison, it was built as a palace and fortress and designed to keep people out. It was used to keep people in, and we have some famous traitors come through here. You might well have heard of some of them, Queen Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's second wife, Queen Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth wife, and these are Tudors. Tudors bore me stiff. I don't like talking about them, but I've got to, so I'll talk about those two floozies later when I show you where they were killed and where they lie to this day. Mel Gibson. <laughs> Mel Gibson should have been brought through these gates and given a really hefty slap. Ever since the colossally inaccurate comedy film Braveheart, but a day goes by without some demented Scot, and I'm not saying you're all demented, it's just the ones I meet, uh, demanding to know, where did you keep William Wallace? He was my father. Check out my blue face. Family resemblance. And that's just the women. The men are much more vocal. It is true that in the winter of 1299, Sir William Wallace did pass through these gates, but you have already spent longer in the tower than Sir William Wallace ever did. Sir William Wallace was knighted by the Scottish court. And something you might not know about the English, but I can tell you with great authority as an Irishman, is that the English are a bunch of snobs. They don't recognise any court but their own. They didn't recognise Sir William Wallace's title. They classed him a commoner. Commoners weren't held here, and nor were they beheaded for treason. Sir William Wallace was immediately taken from here to Smithfield Market, about a mile and a half to the northwest, <coughs> where in full public view he was hanged by the neck until... Yes. until really uncomfortable, actually. They only half hanged him, they hauled him up, let him swing, let him down, took the noose from around his neck and revived him. When he came round he saw a knife, alarmingly, going into his chest, and it was pulled down in a line nipples to navel, so he was opened up. It wasn't a fatal wound, and it wasn't meant to be. William Wallace was entirely conscious when his executioner's filthy hands plunged inside and disemboweled him. Thirty-six feet of his intestines spilled out onto the pavement with a gush of blood which must have steamed in the cold winter air. <laughs> These entrails were then placed on a hot griddle where they sizzled and at this point Mel Gibson would have you believe a man can shout FREEDOM! <laughs> I just don't think that's likely. He must have had other things on his mind. His heart was being ripped out, and that's got to be a distraction. The heart was thrown into a brazier to burn, and that probably killed him. The head was taken off, that was left on London Bridge. The body was hacked into four pieces, and those quarters were then sent north to the border town between England and Scotland. Left on their gates to rot as a warning to the barbaric and troublesome Scots not to upset the clearly civilised, peace-loving and harmonious <laughs> bloody English. So, Sir William Wallace, a truly great man from a truly great nation, was hanged, drawn and quartered. Yeah. One gets nostalgic. <laughs> and hungry. <laughs> On a happier note, behind you we have the Bloody Tower. Again, not its original name. Originally, this was known as the Garden Tower, and we've changed it for marketing purposes. <laughs> in 1483, the Garden Tower was so comfortable, this was the home of the King of England, Edward V. You might not have heard of him, he was only 12. His younger brother, Richard, the Duke of York, was just 10, and they were here under the protection of their uncle, Richard, the Duke of Gloucester. And they needed protection, because there was a war on, the War of the Roses. Now, this sounds like fun, but they weren't fighting with flowers. It was a bloody civil war, and it straggled on for nearly 30 years. These boys were targets, and Gloucester knew it. He took his protection duties so seriously that he had Parliament declare his nephews bastards. They couldn't keep the crown, and he took it. He became King Richard III. He was now the target. His nephews continued to play safely in these grounds long after his coronation. All of that's fact, documented, and unargued. It is also a fact possibly a sad one, that these lads disappeared. Nobody knows when, why or how, but Shakespeare tells us that one night in 1483 they fell asleep up there and never woke up. During the night they were smothered to death with their own pillows. Stabbed with a dagger for good measure. 
Now I'd like you children, especially you young children, to think about that at bedtime. <laughs> um, your mummies and daddies are going to tell you that that was a long time ago, and that's true. They're going to tell you there are no more bad men. <laughs> that's a lie. There are bad men. There are very, very bad men. They're not always out there, though. Sometimes they're under your bed. Wardrobe. They wait for you to go to sleep, and that's when they strike. Sweet dreams, kids. <laughs> really don't like children. <laughs> Their disappearance was a mystery for nearly 200 years. In 1674, Whiteman, on the south side of the White Tower, removed a stone stairwell. Under that stairwell there was a box, and inside this box were the dusty remains of two children. The experts at the time declared them to be the bones of the princes, and Charles II commanded that they should be laid to rest in Westminster Abbey, in Innocent's Corner, which he'd named in their honour. Who killed him? Don't know. Shakespeare would have you believe it was Uncle Richard, but let us not forget that Shakespeare was writing to amuse a redhead, and you never upset a redhead. She was Elizabeth I. Her grandfather was Henry Tudor. He defeated Richard at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. He had no real claim to the throne, but he took the crown from Richard's dead head and placed it upon his own. He declared himself king. He could not have done that if these lads had been alive. And it's entirely possible that Henry Tudor had those boys murdered. You see, Shakespeare couldn't write that. History is nearly always written by the people who win. This explains all the empty pages in French history books. <laughs> we do know that what Shakespeare referred to as the Tower of Blood, Elizabeth I chose to name the Bloody Tower. The gateway to the inner ward, and we're about to charge through it. Charge is a military term. It means to move rapidly to engage in eager combat with an enemy. So let's not have the Italians at the front. We're charging, we're charging, we're charging. We can't wait till he gets the American.